Listen, Lit Hub presents Firekeeper Daughter. Written by Angeline Bully. Read for you by Listen Lit Hub. Chapter 21. On Saturday, I stare at the tribe's billboard on my way through downtown. Despair drops anchor in the pit of my stomach. The left side has N E V E R. F O R G E T in white letters on a dark brown. Heather's senior picture, along with her description and the phone number for tribal police, fills the other half. It isn't until I pass by that I notice the outline of the twin towers behind. The bold lettering. They had meant to never forget about 9 slash 11. Two separate posters. Heather's mom looked rough last night on TV. Hard living and more than one stint in county jail. She claimed the police weren't doing enough to look for her daughter. I make a mental note to ask Jamie or Ron if anything can be done to increase the search efforts. On Sugar Island, I head south and east until the asphalt ends. The jeep rocks side to side on the uneven dirt road beyond. Oh, good pony, I say, patting the dashboard when I park. Taking my cue from Jonesy's masterpiece of organization, I have a backpack with clear storage bags, a roll of tan masking tape for making, labels, and a black sharpie. I've also packed a map of the island folded so. The panel shows only Duck Island along with bottled water, latex gloves, bug dope, red cotton yarn, tiny scissors, a digital camera, and a notebook, with a pen tethered by a yarn leash to its spiral binding. On my walk to the narrow section of land that makes Duck Island a peninsula, instead of an actual island, I come upon the caretaker's cabin on the preserve. I halt. A memory washes over me like a gentle rain. My dad carrying me on his shoulders as he hiked past the cabin to his best secret fishing spot on Duck Lake. I want to stand here and blink until he's next to me. I hear Jonesy's voice. Instead, get to work, sis. You're burning daylight. Somewhere on Duck Island, Uncle David found a unique variety of Mushroom. To explore the area methodically, I decide to view it as the torso of a body getting a CAT scan. I stand at the southeastern side of the peninsula, the edge of Lake George, and tie a snip of red yarn around a birch tree top. Mark my starting point. I take ten paces north along the shoreline and mark another tree with yarn. The average person's stride is about 30 inches, but since I have such long legs, my strides are probably closer to a full yard. So my cross sections will be 30 feet deep for the width of the island east to west. Cutting through the middle of Duck Island, I reach Duck Lake to the west. I head south until I'm at the narrow starting point of the peninsula and Mark the first tree, marking ten paces north along the shore of Duck Lake. Establish my northwestern boundary. I canvass the section, looking for the damp places soil or softwood, where mushrooms grow. When I find something, I take pictures, log it in my notebook, and collect a sample in a sandwich bag. Later, I'll look up each sample in the three mushroom encyclopedias that were among Uncle David's books. Mom had me add all of his books to the library at the big house after we emptied his apartment. In addition to my uncle's reference books, I found a mushroom foraging website that is searchable by location or species. My goal is to find something that hasn't been cataloged. I am not looking for a match, rather, for the absence of a match. Donis, 
We don't prove a hypothesis is true. We search for evidence to disprove a null hypothesis. Uncle David's voice is as clear as if he is walking behind me. He taught me so much. I can follow in his footsteps, do what he would have done. Is it wrong to be excited about a research project that has so much at stake? The woods are medicinal, engaging all my senses and connecting me to something timeless, like being in the zone, except I'm not running. Leaves flutter to the ground, critters scurry nearby. The scents of pine, cedar, and moss mixing together. When I complete the first section, I begin again with ten paces north, along Lake George. I explore Duck Island in cross sections for the rest of the morning. I take an early afternoon break to eat some cheese and crackers and juicy honey crisp apple. I check my watch. My mother thinks I am studying. All day at the university library. My plan is to do a few more sections before I go home and look up today's samples. Tomorrow, I'll come back as soon. As mom leaves for Sunday mass and put in more hours, I take ten paces north and mark a tree. There's a patch of pansies just beyond my boundary, yellow with purple markings or with their coloring, reversed. Grandma Pearl gathered these vivid flowers. She mixed them with melted bear grease as an ointment for my dad's eczema. I drank tea made. From dried petals she kept in a coffee tin. She boiled purple petals to use as a dye for the strips of black ash that would be twisted into the weaving for a colorful accent in her baskets. I've always liked pansies. When I did my coming-of-age fast, it rained. The entire time, it stopped only once. Enough for me to take in the woods, surrounding the large boulder where I huddled, which was like the hull of an overturned boat. There was a patch of colorful pansies, and their markings looked like little faces. When the rain returned, and I went back. Under my tarp, I imagined them as spirit helpers keeping me company. Something black darts past. A raven pausing to rest on a small boulder. At the water's edge beyond the pansies. I recall Macy's story at the bonfire. The way I heard the story from Grandma Pearl, the Agayagi, was a way making mischief when Creator handed. Out gifts. What will I do? Oh, why was I so naughty? How can I ever find my purpose? Gaya Gayagi visited Makwa to see if he could learn her ways, but he grew. Bored, all she did was lumber through the woods finding medicines. He flew away and observed each of his friends using their gifts. Again, he scolded himself for being naughty and missing out on receiving his own. Gift. One day, as he was flying around, he heard Ajidamu crying in a hole in an oak tree surrounded by the acorns he had collected. What is the matter, Ajidamu? I am sad, and I have no joy for anything I once loved doing. Maybe you should go see Makwa. She knows about medicines. Maybe there is a tea she can make for you. Come with me. I will take you there. Koagagayagi led a Junamu to Makwa. Sure enough, Makwa had the right medicine for him. A pleased feeling came over Gayagayagi as he flew away. He kept going until he came upon Wabu's crying. What is the matter, Wabu's? I cannot relax as long as that sly Wagash is trying to eat me. But, Waboos, Creator gifted you long ears and quick feet. You can hear things that others cannot. 
No one moves more quickly than you. You will have a head start on Wawagosh if you honor your gifts. That is true, said Wawaboos. Me Gwetch, me G. As he flew away, Gaia Gaiagi had that good feeling again. He had spent so much time flying around, watching his friends using their gifts, that he had come to know their strengths and how they might help one another in their time of need. And that Al Gagalji discovered that his gift was in solving problems. I am smiling when I approach the blackbird on the small black boulder. And how will you help me, Gaia Gaige? I ask quietly. The smell hits me when I realize something is just beyond the boulder. Along the shore, a body. Pulling my sweatshirt to cover my nose, I take hesitant steps aligned. With my shallow, halting breaths, I reach the boulder and peer around. Eyelids still half open, eyes gone, pecked or nibbled. I stumble backward. It doesn't smell like dead body. How would Jonesy know what a dead body smelled like? Because rotting flesh is unlike anything else. I know that I, too, will never forget the smell of Heather Narden's body. Chapter 22 It isn't until I'm close to Auntie's that my phone connects with a cell tower. Across the river, I burst into the house, talking to the 911 operator. No, she doesn't have a pulse. I told you she's dead. My aunt comes running from the laundry room, wide-eyed with concern. Heather Noden washed up Lake George down by Duck Island. I gesture to the phone, telling Auntie I've told her twice now. I shout into the phone, I-D, I-D, and N-E-D, T-O-T, O-K-A-A-E-D-E-E-S. E-A-U-S-E-S-H-E W-A-S-A-L-R-E-A-D-D-D -D -D. Auntie grabs my cell phone. With her other hand, she yanks me into half. Of a bear hug. We'll meet the police at the caretaker's cabin, she says into the phone. Before flipping it shut and tossing it on the kitchen island, Auntie's other arm wraps me tightly. They do this to calm cows at slaughter. My first year playing hockey for Coach Bobby. He brought me home from an away game. We listened to an NPR interview with Temple Grandin, a scientist who has autism. She invented a squeeze machine for cattle processing that also relieved her. Own sensory overstimulation. Mom came outside to check on me, when. Coach's car remained parked in the driveway, and I still hadn't exited. I had wanted to finish listening to the interview. Coach Bobby rolled down his window when Mom approached. No worries, Grace. She's safe with me. Four cop cars are followed by an ambulance. Auntie grips my hand as we lead a half dozen cops and two MPs along the shoreline. TJ is among the law enforcement officers. When I recognize the boulder the raven showed me, I stop and point. There, I don't want to smell her again. Auntie and I walk back to the small clearing by the caretaker's cabin, where the cars are parked. We sit against the front bumper of her SUV. I focus on the late afternoon sunlight still above the tree line, and make a point of ignoring TJ when he approaches us. What were you doing out here? Officer Quadden asks me. I lean forward and throw up on his police boots. Auntie pours water on a paper towel and wipes my clammy forehead. She hands me a second towel. I wipe my mouth. I take deep breaths as she hands damp paper towels to TJ. School assignment, I say, finally. Plant morphology. Can you radio someone to call her mother? 
Auntie asks him. Shit. Mom will freak out. Double shit. I forgot to notify Jamie or Ron about this. But maybe. Heather isn't connected to the investigation. I got some Molly V. You and your new boyfriend can go all night long. Got other stuff too if you want. I need to call my boyfriend. I cough on the word. Your brother's teammate. TJ's jaw clenches. I nod and dry heave. Officer Kawadin doesn't take any chances. He backs up and walks. Away. For once, I don't resist when my mother insists on taking care of me. I know she's serious as a heart attack when she skips Sunday Mass and her. Daily visit with Grand Mary to watch movies with me all morning. It's kind of annoying, though, when she keeps hopping up from the recliner to top. Off my dainty teacup of never-ending chamomile. meal. Each time she does it, my flash of irritation at her hovering is replaced with guilt for being selfish and ungrateful. I am not the only brat in our house. Hurry naps on my flat chest. Huh. Tuxedo coloring mostly white with a few black spots makes her look cute. If I pause too long from stroking her silky fur, she bites at my fingers. My cell phone buzzes once. Harry gets pissed when I stop petting her. To flip it open. J-A-M-I-E call. M-A-N-O. Come over. Last night, I called Jamie. Long enough to provide a recap of finding. Heather, before my mother interrupted with an offer to run a bath for me. She hasn't let me out of her sight since. When the movie ends, Mom asks what I want to watch next. Hocus Pocus, I say. Is that a good choice? Doesn't it have her voice drops to a whisper? Dead people. It's fine, Mom. I roll my eyes and instantly regret it when she blinks. Hurt. I push Harry off me and rise quickly. My arms go round Mom the way. Auntie held me tight yesterday. Something breaks my heart when her tense. Shoulders shake. This is how we've always been. Grand Mary was like Harry. She pushed me, and I could push back, confident in knowing exactly where the limits were. As with Harry, my formidable grandmother and I nipped at each other, not enough to break them. Skin, but just enough to get a point across. But my mother is always moving the line, so that I never know what will. Make her crack. All I know is that her fragile emotions are like pond ice. During spring thaw, when she stops crying, I kiss her cheek. A friend is coming over. Is that okay? You met him, Jamie. We are more than friends now, I babble. Mom's conflicted emotions are so easy to read. Surprise, happiness, concern. I answer her unspoken questions. Jamie is a good person, Mom. Very respectful of me and all I've been through. I let go of her and take my teacup to the kitchen sink. I rinse it out and set it upside down in the dish drainer. I need to talk with Jamie, which won't be possible if Mom is filling teacups and baking a batch of cookies. For my friend. Would it be okay to have some privacy? I ask, gently. Again, her anxious face reads like a script. No. Okay. I'll fold some laundry and ride the exercise bike. Reluctantly, when Jamie arrives, my mother greets him with a hug. She asks if he's nervous about next weekend's season opener, and he admits that, yes, he is. Very anxious. Mom makes her polite retreat to the basement. As soon as I hear the television in the family room, I look at Jamie and put a finger to my lips. He watches with a bemused expression as I go to the bookcase to retrieve the baby monitor sensor that will convey all upstairs sounds when 
My mother is in the basement. I move it to the antique armoire that has been retrofitted to hold the television and DVD player. Mom will either listen to Hocus Pocus or shut off the baby monitor receiver downstairs. Donis, secret squirrel extraordinaire, is a sneaky agidemo. I motion for Jamie to follow me as I tiptoe down the hallway. When I reach my bedroom, he's not directly behind me. He got sidetracked by the multiple oversized framed photo collages along the way. The life story of Donis Lorenza Fontaine. I batted his arm the way Harry does when she wants me to pay attention to her. Jamie owns in on a picture of seven-year-old me looking miserable in a sequined pink figure skating outfit tight as sausage casing. Finally, I have to drag him into my bedroom. Jamie eyeballs my room. He pauses in front of the dresser. A framed photo shows Lily and me dressed up for Halloween as two of the sister witches. From Hocus Pocus, she thought it would be funny if I was the glamorous sister, so I wore the blonde wig. Harry jumps onto the dresser and nudges Jamie's hand to pet her. Who's this? He asks while rubbing behind Harry's ears. Harry Harrington. She's named after NASA astronaut John Harrington, who was a member of the Chickasaw Nation and was the first made of American to walk in space. I keep babbling. Did you know that? John Harrington brought an eagle feather to the International Space Station. I didn't. That's really cool, he says. Harry purrs loudly, approving of Jamie's nimble-fingered technique. I nearly forget why I invited him over. So I didn't mention it before, I whisper. Heather offered me ecstasy. Mixed with Viagra at the bonfire. Weed, too. You're supposed to tell me things right away, Jamie quietly. Admonishes the donus in the mirror above the dresser. Not a week later. I didn't think it was anything, but now I do. Her death wasn't suspicious, according to Ron. Drowning in September? Washing up on Duck Island? How is that not? Suspicious? The gold-framed mirror makes us look like a photograph. I turn my back to the dresser. She used to be Heather Swanson, I say. Everyone knew her dad was Joey Noden, but he denied it. Supposedly, he threatened Heather's mom when she asked for child support. But once the casino opened and the tribe started paying per cap, Joey claimed paternity and enrolled Heather in the tribe. People say Joey paid her mom's shady boyfriend to set her up for a drug bust so she would lose custody. The custodial parent gets the kids minor money. Jamie raises the eyebrow on the perfect side of his face. I keep whispering. I told you before that per cap can be good or bad, depending on how it is used. There's a lot of good things about per cap. Auntie buys back land on Sugar Island that got sold to the Zaganash during hard times. He says nothing. But when it comes to the worst aspects of per capita payments, everyone mentions Heather. Auntie said her case led to tribal council. Amending the tribal enrollment code. There's a process now for non-tribal. Members claiming their babies are tribal. DNA test to establish paternity. Right from the start. Jamie interrupts me. DNA tests can tell you what tribe you're from. Shh. Finger to lips again. He turns to me. Awfully close. I move a step away and keep talking in a low voice. You're thinking of those bullshit ancestry tests where you mail your 
spit in a test tube and they say you're 18% Native American. Those tests are imperfect. They generalize results to geographic regions, not specific countries or tribes or bands. People take those tests and think they can enroll in a tribe. Doesn't work like that. He frowns. Jamie works undercover, going into tribal communities and playing a role. I never live anywhere long enough to find out what normal feels like. Is it possible that whoever he really is, he has no community? I could tell him what I know, share information that isn't about the investigation, but might be of interest to whoever he is behind his shield. Paternity tests use any type of body fluid to extract DNA to compare the child to the father or his siblings. The tribe requires a blood test. They, they, we're going to require hair instead until some of the traditional pipe carriers reminded everyone about the violent history of our hair being taken from. Us scalps that were cashed in like animal pelts and boarding schools, cutting children's hair as soon as they were taken from their families. When council debated using blood for the testing, that got heated too. Some said too much blood had been spilled already, but there were others who talked about blood memories. It wasn't just generational trauma that got stored in our blood and passed along but our resilience and language too. So, the tribe voted for blood as the way to help children reestablish their blood connection and for adults who got adopted out to find their way back to their family. Jamie isn't looking at me anymore. He's at my desk now, staring out the window as he absentmindedly pets Harry. His mind is elsewhere. I've bored him with my impromptu speech. Everything you always wanted to know about DNA, but were too afraid to ask. Maybe he wasn't curious after all. Anyway, council tried fixing it so no one else would go through what Heather did. You knew her, so I don't want to say anything bad, Jamie says. He turns from the window but evidently running off without telling anyone and having a bag of weed and one full of pills and crystal meth in her. Hoodie pouch wasn't out of character. I don't care about that. She deserves to have someone give a damn. Now he is the one to raise his finger to his lips. Something pulls me away from the red hot flare of anger. What he just said about the contents of her hoodie pouch. Could it be a clue? Jamie, there wasn't any meth in the bag she showed me. Just speckled pills. I want to join Jamie in talking with Ron about the drugs found on Heather. You had a traumatic experience yesterday, Donis. Take it easy today, Jamie whispers in my ear as I pick up the baby monitor to return it to the bookcase. I cover the microphone part, just in case mom is listening. Don't tell me what to do. He pinches the bridge of his nose and heads to the front door. I fight the urge to throw the damn baby monitor at him. Following behind, I catch up as he reaches his truck. Just as I do, Macy's royal blue. Corvette turns onto my street. You two need to establish relationship patterns for people to observe. Ron said, Did I think to pray for Zoon Gaidwin today? No, because why would I? Need bravery to stay home all day with Mom and Hari? I offered Samaya this morning and prayed for Zai Gidiwin, for Heather Noden. To know love is to know peace. I wish that for her in the next world because I think it eluded her in this one. I embrace Jamie from behind. His body goes rigid. My arms circle his. 
Waste and I hold him in an impromptu squeeze machine. Macy's car is coming. We gotta make this look good, I say quickly. He smells like the beach and sunshine. Jamie gives a casual wave to the passing car. I kiss the side of his neck. The pulse of his carotid artery beats against my lips. And that, Macy Manitou, is called acting. Jamie leaves. Mom stands at the door, weeping. Sighing, I go inside to decipher her tears and figure out how to comfort her. Reading people was something Lily and I had in common. My best friend said that when she lived with her mom, Lily could tell. Within three seconds, whether Maggie's latest relationship was good or bad, assessing the situation to determine if she needed to be funny, Lily, invisible Lily, I thought I could relate. Mom carried herself differently on Sad days, still mourning her relationship with my dad. I'd need to comfort. My mother make tea, give hugs, and watch a lighthearted movie together. It's kind of the same thing, I told Lily. No, it's not, she said. Your mom never took it out on you when a relationship ended. It takes all of five seconds from the driveway to the front door to discern. Mom's mood. Observation, tears, but without her sad days slouched posture and wistful half-smile. Diagnosis, I'm growing up, and mom wishes my uncle were here to see it. Prescription, hugs, sympathy, suggest a nap afterward, and tea. David won't be there to walk you down the aisle, mom says. I resist the urge to tell her, holy wah, I'm 18 going on 19. Instead, I hold her until she's done crying. Mom, why don't you lie down and I'll bring a cup of tea, chamomile. While my mother naps, I try finishing the movie. It's no use. I'm too fidgety. Perry nips my fingers because I'm ruining her plans to nap on my chest. My mind won't stop racing. Jamie and Ron are communicating with the FBI to find out everything. That was on Heather, a complete inventory. Meanwhile, I have to stay home, be a useless secret squirrel. Work the problem, Donis. Uncle David taught me to think like a scientist. It wasn't enough to make haphazard lists. You needed to sequence the order of tasks. I miss him, not just because mom was as carefree as she could ever be around her little brother, but because he was good and kind. He loved me and my boundless curiosity. Once, Grand Mary grew weary of my endless questions over Sunday. Dinner. Curiosity killed the cat, Donis, Grand Mary said. Yes. But satisfaction revived her. Uncle David scored the equivalent of a hockey snapshot. Quick, more about surprise than power. I can't talk about the investigation with Auntie or Granny June. Uncle David would understand. He'd help me work the problem. He taught me the seven steps of the scientific method. Observe, question, research. Hypothesize, experiment, analyze, conclude, order from chaos. Organize and document everything, Donis. That's it. I stand so quickly that Harry flees from my eureka moment. My uncle logged every experiment, each step of his beloved scientific method. Him that was not meticulous. Uncle David went missing before he could provide any evidence. He discovered something he wasn't supposed to know. That's why he isn't here. I'll trace his footsteps, but carefully. Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction revived her.